It's my great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce just a little bit uh, of our speaker today. Uh, Humayra Rakadari is well known um, uh, for her recent book, uh, it's a memoir, uh, called Dancing in the Mosque, uh, an Afghan mother's letter to her son. Um, her son, uh, who is the recipient of this uh, mother's letter, is named Siawash, um, and he's here with us. So Siawash, would you stand and wave? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for also uh, coming and being with us. Uh, Humayra Kadri uh, is uh, a women's rights activist, a, a scholar of Persian literature, and an author, uh, not only of uh, this compelling memoir, um, but also uh, of fiction. In fact, uh, she just recently completed her, her latest uh, work of fiction, which uh, focuses on uh, the historical memory of conflict uh, in Afghanistan, and um, is, hasn't yet um, made it to press, but we're excited for you to meet her today and, and that you'll have a chance to read that, uh, uh, that novel when it comes out as well. Uh, 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 Ms. Qadari was born uh, in uh, Kabul uh, and lived much of her life in Herat in Afghanistan. Uh, she has uh, trans, uh, transited um, uh, to Iran and to India on several occasions. She earned her PhD in Persian literature at Jawaharlal Nehru, did I get that right? University in Delhi um, in India. Um, and uh, she uh, has lived under the Taliban during the Taliban's um, first takeover of Afghanistan. Her father uh, was uh, a member of the Mujahideen who fought against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, she was a young woman when the Taliban took over Afghanistan um, after a period of intense civil war and fighting. Um, she uh, later married, uh, moved to Iran, uh, and then uh, has lived a little bit of her life in uh, the United States and then moved back um, to Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban, where she served in a couple of very important governmental advisory positions. Um, she then um, fled Afghanistan as the Taliban re-entered and was on the last flight uh, before the United States pulled out uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, if you remember, it was a very chaotic and very difficult time uh, to leave the country, and uh, both Siawash and Homaira were able to, to uh, come and they've been in the United States since then, first uh, as a resident scholar at Harvard University, the Radcliffe Institute, and now as a research fellow at the Center for Middle East Studies at Yale University. So we're really, really pleased that uh, she took the time to be with us uh, today. Uh, our format today will be a little bit unusual. Uh, we're going to start uh, with some remarks by Dr. Qadari. Uh, she would like to share uh, some images and some stories about uh, her experience uh, working in the education sector and living in the education sector uh, in Afghanistan. She has been a tireless advocate for education, uh, for human right, rights, and particularly for um, women's opportunities in Afghanistan, where those opportunities have often been very constrained. Um, when she concludes with her remarks, we're going to move, I'm going to move into a discussion with her uh, at the front of the room. We're going to talk a little bit uh, more specifically about her personal journey, uh, her memoir, uh, and some things that uh, she can share with us about how we might think of Afghanistan today and the directions that Afghanistan may go. Please join me in welcoming Homaira Qadri. Hi, everyone. Thank you to your university for having me here, especially from um, Kennedy Center. Thank you so much, Queen McCain, for inviting me. Uh, and it's very um, good and wonderful experience for me. Me and Siobash discussed that your um, university, at least as we are seeing now, um, Kennedy Center is so active. We're going across the world. and. That's the first university that we say we see that they have many programs. Wonderful. And Siobash told me right now, I wish I was there 
I, I was here for next um, Wednesday because he's very his uh, air is very you know on for Nazis words. He read a lot. He read the Anna Frank diary, so and movies and all that kind of memoir. So he's very uh, smart for this word. So thank you for having us. And I wanted to see um, where is the. I don't need the laptop, no? Oh, okay. Um, I want to start it with the, um, some um, picture, personal picture, family pictures. And just one minute to see. Yes. Um, I don't know why we are going all the way. Nope. So I have um, maybe four or three pictures from all my entire life, and not from, from, from all my entire childhood. As you know, I lived all my life, these 40 years, in war zone, in a war time. I never lived, even one day, in peace. So we always left everything that we ha have in our life um, include our pictures and in everything that we had. I when I started to with my family, the woman, the girls who took these pictures, just was killed, was shot after two days that we had this picture. It was my um, um, older uh, aunt, and the man, as you see, my uncle, uh, he was um, arrested um, with the hot service. It was the um, intelligence agency in Afghanistan and tortured. He lost many of his organs and especially his kidney during the torture, his teeth. And we lost these babies and during the war time. My younger aunt, this woman, this girl was shot but she survived. And this is me during the uh, United, uh, during the Soviet Union occupation of Afghanistan. And this is my youngest uncle, and he lives, he lived most of his life at this age in the bottom of the wheel of the, our house because he, the family didn't want, because he was young for, um, it, he was young for war, but at that time he was okay to, uh, was, was sent for war and so my grandfather decided to hide him to not involve with wars with not parties of the war at that time so he lives in bottom of the wheel so we lost many of our families during that times and when i'm saying during that time i mean when um i had the experience of soviet union occupation i have the experience of civil war four years of civil war and i have the experience of five, six years of Taliban, the first time, 1996, and after that, 20 years of war with Taliban again and United States when occupied Afghanistan. We survived, some of us, and we, last, we lasted till the Taliban times. And this, I don't have any picture from the Civil War um, times. This is the picture that I have from Taliban time. Um, this woman. This girl, actually. I was 13 at that time. I was like a teacher for this group of girls and even boys in my home because, as you know, um, when Taliban occupied Afghanistan for the first time in 1996, uh, they even didn't allow the girls to go to a school uh, even for the first um, grade. But now, as you know, they, the girls can go to a school till sixth grade, but at that time, they were not allowed. And I don't know what happened for this group of these students, but I know after the Taliban uh, failed at the first time in 2021, in 2001, many of them could to, uh, go to a school and after that university. But with this uh, second time collapse, I don't know what happened for some of these um, child. But at least I can mention to these 
2004, this boy, he's my youngest brother. And after the Taliban occupied Afghanistan in 2021, um, he was around 24 at that time. They arrested him. He was at the jail for one year. After he released, he is um, a poet and a journalist right now. And um, they sentenced him for one year in jail in a military court where he's a poet and journalist. We advocate for him a lot, but we couldn't to find some way for release him. But he was at jail for one year. And uh, now he is in French, but he lost many of his teeth, like my ankle that I showed you. So it means like for us, it's like a circle. Nothing has changed even after 20 years. So um, this is me. Um, I, I taught girls. Um, in my uh, house in Afghanistan um, when Taliban uh, was uh, as a ruler in the 1996. And it was my journey for next 20 years of my life. And I worked with the Ministry of Education in Afghanistan and with the Ministry of Labor and Social. And it was my job to go around the country and see what's going on in our schools. Here is Nangarhar, as you see, um, even the Nangarhar, the weather is extremely hot. And these girls doesn't, didn't have, and now I don't know what's going on for them, but they didn't have even one tent to shade their heads at that time. And here is Herat, my city. It's a you know, famous city, but it's still our children, no matter girls or boys, still they are studying on their tent. And here is Bamiyan. Look at their face. Here is near to uh, spring, but because of the cold weather, you can see this, this sign, red sign on their face. And they usually, uh, I can show in this picture to you. It doesn't work. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know why. I'm not good with these. Mm. <sighs> Can you please? Yeah, yeah. I want to go. This. Yeah, it's better with I, if I use from this, not in a slideshow. that picture. I wanted to show the, the two girls together on the 14, slide 14, please, if you make it. Yeah. These girls is um, going to a school for walking two hours and a half from home to his school. And the weather was cold. Look at his face. And he, she totally covered herself. Can you look? Please go for the next slide. And these girls, they are living in, it's totally like Utah. When I came here, I feel that I am in Bamiyan again because the mountain and the cold weather, um, but not with this facility. They are living and they are studying this with Kelly and Break. They make it, it's a, like a school for them. And, but you look at their girls, they are really friendly and they are very willing to study. It just, I think it was the last um, winter that I was in Afghanistan. And those girls all was at the grade 12. And I know after that, we don't know what's happened for them. And they were full of, uh, you know, um, wishes at that time. Can you please go to the next slide? Here it's me. And um, yeah, again there, this woman all are the girls who belonged to the first time that Taliban occupied Afghanistan in 1996, and they couldn't to go to a school. They married, and they are, you know, as you see, they are mothers from the new generation, but they are started to study again. They are living in Kandahar in a very extremist um, city of Afghanistan, and it was me. And for searching them and finding them and sitting in them in the class, I had to go to Ali to Ali in Kandahar with this Okay, but still, they learned. They uh, willing to learn. And please, can you go?
go for the next one. Yeah, next one. Um, here is the last, uh, our last Minister of Education in this um, in Afghanistan, and as you see, we work in even the Corona period of the time. That because um, in Afghanistan, uh, we did we don't have um, we didn't had at that time, um, you know, uh, electricity power. We didn't have internet. We didn't have a laptop for all of these students in Afghanistan. So we just tried to find some way to how, while we are in quarantine, how we can continue, how we can find some remotely way to uh, students learn their studies. Um, because we also face with quarantine. Um, he is our last minister, and they are also um, others um, employee of Afghanistan Education Ministry. Uh, you can go, please. And here, my uh, journey wasn't uh, only in a school. I was as a professor at university. And um, here is at Garjestan University in Afghanistan. Can you please? Yep. And you know, we didn't. We have some classes only for girls. Um, they were segregated, but we had some classes with boys and girls together. They are also my last picture from Kabul at our university. Um, it's still Afghanistan and my students. You can go, please. Yes. But at the same time, while we try to uh, make reach the educational system in Afghanistan, we had to sit with the, some you know, um, religious scholar. I was at Turkey. Turkey with this um, um, religious scholar, uh, we tried to convince them to sanction the Taliban behavior against women at that time. But that time, Taliban was not like a ruler in Afghanistan. And this man barely allowed me to take a picture with him because I don't know what year it is, but he told me at that time, he was sure that will Taliban return to Afghanistan, take the power, they will take the power, and his picture with me will be a problem for him. You know, they, they knew it. Uh, yeah, please go. And this is the, um, look at the year, uh, I hope. Yeah, it, it's uh, around 1999, um, 24 years before. He, this newspaper was our only newspaper in Herat in the period of uh, Taliban time. And my story, my first story was published in this newspaper under my name, and which was totally forbidden at that time. Um, can you please? Yeah. And this man was, at that time, in every Monday, four girls of Herat, we sit together in a one classes, Heidli classes, and we um, supposed to, and our classes were, um, the name of our classes was, classes was the, the Golden Needle Swing Circle of Herat. We supposed to do needlework, but we read a study, we read a story and we write a story. And this man was the only um, teacher at that time who t taught us how we should write a story. Uh, and we lost him just three days ago in Herat. He is very famous because he was like a lecturer, very famous lecturer for creative writing in Afghanistan. And as a teacher, a man, it was very important because when I'm saying 24 years ago, he was very young. And he accepted that risk to come to a secret class and study young women, four young women. Um, OK. So I started to write at the 1998 or maybe seven. And after that, I continue writing. It's my, I, th I think it's my first book, Talisa. It's fiction book. And it's the second one, Eklima. Most of this book was published in, were published in uh, Iran. And yep, please. And I think it's the, yeah, it's the second one. And the Nokre was, uh, Eklima was the third one. OK, please. And also, I had some books for. Uh, um, children in Afghanistan. It wasn't, you know, usual to have literature for uh, children, but 
in these last 20 years, many of uh, writers started to uh, not just write for adults, we started to write for um, children too. So writing for children was also totally new in my country. And after that, you could find my books in the street. These children, they are um, from the other uh, city of Afghanistan. They are um, displaced internal immigrants in Afghanistan. Solomon ruined their house, and they all um, escaped to Kabul the, in the capital. But I launched one of my books with them in the city. It's a private school, and as you say, they are street school, uh, street um, um, child, they are working on their street. And Dancing in the Mosque is my first book that is not fiction, it's non-fiction, it's a memoir that was published in English. I have seven books and that one is the only uh, non-fiction book that I have in English. And it was published, uh, it was translated to Italy, German, um, translated in Finland, Germany, uh, French, and Italy. Uh, yeah, French, Germany. And at that time also, I had a creative writing class. Um, this is student is belong to that class. Um, it's also last winter that I was in Afghanistan. Um, most of them right now write for the many newspaper in Afghanistan, but with the, you know not with their real name. But they are in Afghanistan and they are continue to write, okay? And what I'm doing right now, as I'm working in my new book, Tell Me Everything, I'm remotely teaching creative writing to uh, my students in Afghanistan. We can see, we see each other with the different classes every week. And uh, they're coming through the, you know, Google meeting because it's more uh, cheap and more easy to access to it in Afghanistan. And they write, they send me in many WhatsApp group that we have, different WhatsApp group that we have, and we read uh, many um, books together. It's not easy to have these books, especially after the Taliban occupied again Afghanistan. And um, we find PDF in internet, we send to them, they read, and every week we see each other and uh, speak about creative writing. And as I know, many of them uh, write for many newspapers in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan and out of Afghanistan, but it's still not on their, on their, uh, their names. They had to change it or put some another name. Thank you. So we are here for the discussion for books. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we so appreciate you sharing some of those oh, images and, and uh, that background. Um, I know that there have been many people that have um, seen you as a role model and a mentor, uh, both in creative writing and also uh, as an activist and an advocate uh, for, for women's rights. Uh, Thank you. I, I'd like uh, to start by talking about a few of the things that we find in your memoir. Um, and then we'll move progressively toward the present, if that's okay. Um, we'll talk together for about 15 minutes, and at that point we'll open it up to the audience and we invite your participation um, by standing and um, asking questions to Homaira as well. Uh, we have half an hour together, uh, and so we will finish today at 1 p.m. Uh, much of the, um, the action, in some ways, of, of your book... Uh, Myra is takes place when you're a young woman. Um, you, you mentioned that you're 13 years old uh, when one phase of the Afghan civil war ends. The Taliban come in, uh, they take control of the capital and most of the country. Uh, and the, the norms and expectations for women in particular, but also for much of society, dr dramatically changes. Uh, so you are on uh, the verge of. Tr of, of developing your own identity and uh, figuring out who you are as a young person when this takes place. Can you tell us a little bit about who your friends were at that time, uh, what became of them, uh, why you made the choices you did, and, and how you navigated the Taliban as a young woman? Uh, you know, uh, Queen, uh, it's very hard, not for me, for all of Afghan people, 
uh, when we have heard that uh, Joe Biden had a press conference at the last days, or last days, yes, and told people of Afghanistan didn't fight for themselves, so we withdraw. I bring this story as a very ordinary woman from Afghanistan to show you that we are working for ourselves very hard, not just in these 20 years that United States and other country, all not country war, were in our um, Afghanistan, even before that, before they came to our country, we worked hard for our us. And um, the situation of Afghanistan always was a hard on human being, no matter woman or man. So I bring this story to you to show you that we worked very hard. And this hard working for me at least started at the, when I was 13, when and Taliban uh, for the first time conquered my city. They, uh, con they couldn't conquer Afghanistan at the same time. They started, for example, with Kandahar, one of our uh, um, big cities. And, but they arrived in my city in 1996, and from that day when they arrived, the rule announced by um, mosque, and it was totally, those rules was totally new. Even um, for my grandfather, who was a very extremist man, a very extremist religious man, uh, and it was very new for us to see that Taliban, or a group, came and um, excluded us from the society. Um, I remember that for one year, uh, every day we were waiting for the school to open. And after one year, we understand that it, it, we understood that it, the school is closed and it is a, it's part of their identity to fight with their woman. So they never open it, at least while they, they uh, are in Herat. And after that, my mother helped me. He gave her kitchen to me, and I turned her kitchen to a school, and we started to fight against the Taliban in our kitchen. And our men, they started fighting against them in separate uh, mountains. Afghanistan is a, a mountain country. And in Panjshir, in uh, Parwan, or some part of my city, and we started to fighting with them with different method. Uh, for me, um, teaching girls and at the same time teaching myself and writing a story was a method to continue our life. But it wasn't easy uh, for all of girls um, at my age at that time. As I told you before, unfortunately, my city is the famous for the um, Suicide. Um, most of my friends uh, put themselves on fire, self-immolated, when the Taliban took the power in 1996. I remember that I lost many friends during um, civil war. I lost many friends during the uh, Soviet Union occupied Afghanistan, but I lost a big number, a huge number of my friends while in Af Afghanistan was in peace when Taliban took the power. There wasn't any war, but we lost many people, especially girls, because they totally excluded from, completely excluded from their social life, and they didn't use to it. We didn't have this experience. And, or another group of them um, accepted to go for arranged marriage in an um, Afghanistan, and if um, life divided uh, for you know two groups, uh, one self emulation and another um, arranged marriage, I was one of the scares who went for arranged marriage at that time. And you, you mentioned that you you grew up in a, a quite a conservative religious family. Yes, but it doesn't mean that we were not allowed to go to a school. Religious had completely different. Uh, we were, a, a, the family were a practical Muslim group, but it doesn't mean that we were not allowed to go to a school. My grandfather, who were, you know, turban, always took me and my sister with his car to his schools, and he was take care of us, everything that we need in a school. So Taliban was 
completely a new group for us. We didn't have this experience. We never had that work, uh, the things that covered the head to tell the toy. We never had it in Afghanistan, but with the Taliban, I don't know from nowhere it is coming and it, uh, you know, changed up to a big uh, market to Afghanistan. We never had that uh, market shopping to buy this kind of cover, real, but after the Taliban. So, so religion in your life growing up, right, was conservative, but uh, education was important. Yeah. Um, uh, measure of personal freedom was important, right? Yes. Um, Human um, rights, especially he, women rights. We had, a, you know, respect in the society, but with the Taliban, it was totally changed. Uh, and then it must have been very, very challenging. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, you mentioned that, that the route that you, you took was an arranged marriage. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the circumstances of, of how you got married and um, what that meant for your family and what it meant for you? Um, you know, uh, we were four friends and I lost uh, um, three of them. And one of my brother who is uh, now living in Boston, um, he was at that time six years old, and he always came to me and asked me, where is your turn? When is your turn? When you wanted to put yourself on fire? And I don't know, I found, you know, hope in the writing, I found hope in teaching, and also my family, my mother helped me to can survive through all this bad situation. Um, my father had a, a small a library at the home, while he was uh, fighting with um, um, Russian soldiers many years ago before the Taliban, but at the same time he used to learn uh, to study their uh, to read their books literature, and we had all those books from Russians in our house. So those books and my mother kitchen, which turned to a school for me to learn and teach, helped me to choice for arranged marriage. And it was not bad because I could to uh, continue my study after that. And but it wasn't totally like, uh, you know, even it wasn't like um, um, others country that people married. For the first time when I was um, when I saw my uh, husband, he was my husband, otherwise we are not allowed to see him. So um, it was full of challenge for me, but the, maybe the only thing that I uh, really satisfied about it, it was that I could continue my study. Mm -hmm. So it means even with the very um, practical Muslim people, continuing study for a woman, it was very normal in any situation. You mentioned a few times now how important <coughs> literature was for you, how important writing was and teaching was. And, uh, for those of us that care about literature and that uh, uh, think about literature as important in our lives too, uh, tell us uh, why, why literature, why writing? What did that do for you as an individual in that difficult circumstance? You know, I remember any, every time that the politics ruined my house, I make a shelter through the books for myself. And even after years, my only weapon um, was my pain for, you know, uh, continue my path and my beliefs in Afghanistan. Um, I think uh, literature was not only for me as a shelter, it was even for my father as a shelter. He told me, I, I even remember when every time he could to come from mountain and visit us when um, he was a Mujahid, he had one very small book of that, only uh, Russian literature. Um, in his pet bag. I didn't know at that time, but because my father took care of this book, after many years I understood that they are belong to Chokhov, Dostoevsky. So it, it wasn't just for me, it, it was even for my father. Literature, it was like a totally a different world. And I always had the, uh, I, I, I saw a Russian soldier with the people who were very big shoes put in and came and had a gun and kill our people. I saw them in our street like that with the, you know, very dusty tongues and they just come and without mercy kill us. But in their books, 
I saw that no, they are not like always a soldier. They, they uh, know how to dance. In their country, they don't kill each other. They dance with each other. And I saw it only in books. So the books, and especially literature books, open a new window for me to understand that people have two sides of a story. They can be soldiers. At the same time, they can be dancers. And I really wanted to see that side of that soldiers in my country. But they, unfortunately, they brought their dark side. And so I think my father and after him, me, we tried and we searched a life that we, li we love to live it, a life that we love to live it. But in the reality, we didn't add it. So we searched in books. And because of that, I always could survive through literature because I could find what I want through the books. Uh, you titled your book Dancing in the Mosque. Can you tell us why you chose that as a title and what the context for that is? Yeah, I really love dance. And uh, I remember that it, this uh, Dancing in the Mosque is the name of one of the chapters in my book. And I was, as a teacher, um, Taliban never allowed to girls go to school. And so there was some displaced people in my city from other city in Afghanistan. And they lost their house, they lost their schools. And so they came and UNICEF gave them some tents. So they had a big tent that they used as a mosque in uh, our neighborhood. Because they were belong to another part of the country, they were not very familiar with us, and also we were not very familiar with their culture. So it was like we lived together, but separately. They had their mosque, they had their house, but they all were like a tent. This wasn't a real house. So my father told me that there are many they, they are many children that all the day they are playing in dust. Why you don't go in their tent and teach them? So my father helped me to use their, that big tent that it was as a mosque for as a class. It, and their family allowed me to use it the, during time that there wasn't use for mosque to use it as a, a school. And the Taliban never understood it, that what we are doing in, in, in that tent. And so one day I remember one of, uh, not one of my students, many of those students didn't come to class. And the day after that, I asked them why you were absent. And one of the boys that was very naughty in the class told that these girls all went to a wedding and they danced. And the boys told me that the girls of our class danced very well. And it means that he watched those girls secretly. And so I was a teenager. I was around, at that time, maybe 14 and 15. So I asked of my students that if they can teach their dance to me in the mosque. And uh, they told me, OK. And we danced together. And suddenly, because one of the Taliban checkpoints was very close, and we collapsed tightly. So it was like all of us was like a, were like a teenager and like a, a child. So they came, and they asked me what are doing. And because the dance was really different, and we were familiar with it. And I scared and freaked out, and I told them that they should to read holy book, Quran, but they couldn't, so I'm punishing them and asking them to run around. So, um, and it was, you know, it was at the Taliban time, dancing and in the mosque. It wasn't, you know, it's a joke. And so I'm, when I'm thinking right now, I never do it. I never repeat it because now I know what the meaning of fear is. But at that time, because I was teenager, so I love this moment of my life in Taliban era. So because of that, I put the name of the that chapter on the cover. Oh, thank you. Um, at, at some point, uh, your marriage ended. Um, and given the nature of the, the patriarchal society of Afghanistan, uh, you weren't able to be with your son. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the journey of, of why Siwash is here today with us and, yeah. and uh, how you were able to secure custody of your son? With any role that I played in my country as a girl, as a wife, or as a mother, I always faced with a lot of challenge because 
uh, even after 20 years of democracy, Afghanistan always um, um, had a problem <laughs> with women. And uh, we tried a lot in these 20 years to change some rule for us, but it wasn't enough to, for me at least, it wasn't enough to keep my son, only son, with me. After, uh, you know, in Afghanistan, when a man, a man, a man can uh, have uh, four wives at the same time, and he can keep them at the same building. So I was at that time, uh, I was a woman with two PhD, seven books. I was a senior minister for uh, um, social, uh, senior advisor for social minister. And my husband, my ex-husband, decided to have another wife. In Afghanistan, when a man take a you know, woman, uh, take another wife, the first woman turned to a number. And so the name is totally you know, vanished, and you will be the, the wife number one. And if the man go for the third one, and the second one goes, she, they say, called her the wife number two, until four. So it was very hard for me to allow the society, culture, uh, and traditions to turn me with my name, with all of suffering that I had in my life, turn me to a number. So I said no to that second marriage. And of course, we are not in that position to say no because the religious allowed them to have four. And the only way for me was to come out from that marriage, and I did it. It wasn't easy in Afghanistan as a woman, you are not allowed to um, go for divorce. It takes many years, many years from you take to um, a judge say, okay, you are divorced right now. But men is easily, while they are eating, they can divorce women. So uh, I, I divorced and um, the journey was not easy for me. And as a punish, as a punishment, my, my ex-husband took my only son from me. And from the moment that I said no to the second marriage, I was not allowed to see, visit him. I was not allowed to even speak through the phone. And so he was belong to his father. In Afghanistan, after you divorce, you are not allowed to see your children, or maybe some family has mercy and say, okay, you can visit your child sometimes, but if you married again, you never ever can see your children because in the culture and uh, tradition, children always belong to men. So uh, they took my son and I, I, I had very, very, very bad years. It took three years for me to put myself together, put myself together, and I started for uh, fighting for his custody. And it wasn't easy. Even it wasn't easy for my family. Many times they told me, they are very educated, open-minded family, and they told me many times that why you are going to court, um, a good woman in Afghanistan never go to a court. And you know, and they told me you are titling yourself as a bad woman in Afghanistan. And I went to court for two years. I show that during the days, um, you make it. You know, you say fake it till make it. I started to show that I'm very strong woman, like a lion. Every day go to court and fight with every court, you know, judge to see and go, you know, against all of those rules. But during the night. I was like a, you know, a mic, mic. <laughs> say I was scared to death because it wasn't easy to fighting with all those taboo in Afghanistan. So it took for me two years till I could to have his custody. But I had his custody just for two years. At the time that I could to have him, he was at the five, and I could have him just for more two years. And um, maybe I was the only mother in the world that I never wanted to my son turn to the seven. Because after that, I had to, again, um, start fighting with the court 
because in these 20 years, we had this um, you know, law that uh, a woman, a good mother, and they say good mother, and they say the definition of good, what's the meaning of that, and say a good mother can have two mo more years of her child or sons or daughter anything. And it's not guaranteed that you can be a winner after that. So um, I was at the, my last days of expression of motherhood that the Taliban occupied Afghanistan and the United States withdraw from my country. So I took him with myself and bring him here and said, any person wanted to fight with me, come here and fight him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn it to the audience. I just want to share maybe just a couple of your thoughts in the afterword of your book um, that I think are relevant to our contemporary period. So you say, there is no end to any story. The timelines of our tales sometimes go their own separate ways, and sometimes they flow into one another and change our lives. The story of Afghan women is tightly woven with the history and politics of our nation. Uh, the story is one of endless misery, woven through times of peace and of war, and it flows with pain. But it never seems to reach the healing ocean. Um, you, uh, you talk a little bit about your journey back to Afghanistan and the role that you played and, and your hopes of uh, reuniting uh, with Siawash. And um, you say, I could not believe that one day I would again be forced to fight the Taliban. Um, but here we are, and the Taliban are back in control of Afghanistan. And uh, I know it's a very, very difficult time um, for Afghan women and Afghan men. Um, and uh, it feels like we're reliving your history. Uh, I think you mentioned to me that first time you dealt with it as a 14-year-old, now you're dealing with it as a 40-year-old. Yeah. But it feels a little bit like you've seen this movie before. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, actually open it up uh, to uh, some questions from the audience. If you do need to leave for a 1 o'clock class, now is a good time to do that. You're welcome to do that. Uh, otherwise, we will we'll finish up in 10 minutes. Okay. Um, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Please stand. Tell us who you are. If you're a student, um, tell us what you study. And uh, we look forward to your participation in the discussion. Um, hi, my name is Hannah. I'm studying public health. My question is, in the United States right now, we are seeing a rise in political extremism, often supposedly religiously motivated, very similar to what has happened repeatedly in Afghanistan. What, how, as someone who has a lot of experience with grassroots like resistance, what would you say to young people who are trying to now do that same thing with our families in the future? In Afghanistan? In the United States. In the United States. So uh, at least I can say, you know, from my country that it's not easy for people like my country, if I can understand your question well, that it's not easy for us to trust to that heavy slogans when um, this country bring to East. Because I remember that United States and other countries came to my country with the, that this Salagons that they came to uh, bring uh, equality, especially gender equality. They came to be with the human rights, especially with women rights. And at the end, look at that. They surrounded us to the Taliban, and uh, um, they leave us alone. Now they are friends with Taliban. They are sending $14 million every week. And there is not any organization to monitor that you know, money to What's going on with that money? If Taliban buying um, more guns and army things, or, or really they are going to give it to poor people. So for people like my country, it's not easy to trust to the government of your country. But we, are, we always put a line between people and the government. You know, it's totally different. And we know that. My government also was, had a lot of problems. There is a line between people and government again. So I think maybe sometimes it would be good if we search our history again. 
Now it's two years past from Afghanistan, two years and a half from evacuation process, from the withdrawal of the United States. And when it's two years and a half is passed, it is something that people have forgot what's going on at that time. And what happened, what happened for the people who left behind. So as a writer, I say, sometimes we need to read our stories or our histories again. And the new generation should be that generation to go through the history. It's not you know, good to forget what everything that happened. We forget it very soon. Um, for new generation, repeat the history. We will learn. I know uh, you said we are living in history right now again, but I am saying that we are living in hell again. For, for us, it's not just history, it's hell again. We, we have this experience. But reading the history for our side, with our knowledge, I am sure that teaches us a lot to be careful about the future. And we don't know what we did with those all young generation in my country. It's not good. We, we are speaking about to be united in the world, you know, about the peace. But with, with this bad uh, withdrawal, we lost that trust that we made it for 20 years. We, you know, lost a lot of soldiers, a lot of human rights. Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> uh, my name is Lutfur Rahman Saeed. I am working with the law school at BYU, and I am from Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, I used to be professor at Kabul University for 27 years at Sharia faculty, Islamic law faculty. I am happy to have you guys here. And we are lucky that we are in this environment and this university with very nice uh, people. Uh, I know you, but not in person. Through your books and through your long story in ups and downs in your life, uh, few people fight or have fought like you. I want to know to share your secret. Besides, you said the only weapon was a pen, and the only shelter was reading books. Is there any other secret in your life to make you, Humaira Qadri, much different than thousands of girls and women? They just gave up. I know most of them, especially in students. I have messages in my uh, WhatsApp, like receiving some of the students. They just want to, life doesn't have any word why we are alive. So they are easily give up. I want to know what was beside these uh, tools you explain. Is there any other thing that I will share with my female students? They used to be my students or family members or friends back in Afghanistan because I am still with touch, in touch with them and they just asking me what the life Meaning. Meaning, guys. Right like it, they, they, they come to the stage that, like, life is nothing. It's the first stage, or maybe not the first one, like the stage to do something against their life. And I'm in touch with them. Unfortunately, I cannot do anything. Just give them I know, advice. I know. Yeah. Thank you. At the first, I'm very happy to see you as a countryman here, and I ask you that if we have any. No, Afghan students here. Uh, nice to meet you here. But honestly, if I be very, very honest and open with you, I wanted to say, still I give up every day, every night. Uh, being a woman from Afghanistan is not easy. And it's not easy to keep hope um, always. You know, sometimes I ask myself, what kind of punishment that I carried all these years to see in these, you know, I don't say that my life, my, my age is short, but in 40 years, faced with Taliban two times, it really is a punishment. 
and it's not easy. I was for the second time. I was also in uh, 2021. I was two weeks in Afghanistan, and I started my uh, again my fighting against Taliban, going to the uh, many TV station at that time, and ask from people to come and speak because you know I knew that the rule of <coughs> Taliban is to exclude you very soon from society. So I wanted from that moment to use those. Um, you know, time and stations for speaking about the woman or speaking for women. Uh, maybe, maybe um, I really um, lo love the life. That was that one of that part that I always fight for uh, life for myself. I always uh, see uh, my books to translate in many languages. You know, I always make some image for myself in the future. And also, I face with some opportunity in my life. We cannot ignore it. Uh, but I knew, and I know not now, that fighting against, against situation in Afghanistan for improve the life for women in Afghanistan is not easy, even when the Taliban uh, were not the ruler of Afghanistan. Even the period of Republic time, it was life. It wasn't easy. I lo not lost, but I couldn't see my son for three years and a half, near to four years, at the time that Taliban were not ruler of Afghanistan. You know, so lost the hope is is usual in Afghanistan. Just think about this situation. Uh, I know many of my students that their sisters, because I'm teaching, you know, um, class 18, but their sisters are at the grade six, but they want to stay at that grade and they don't want to show that they, you know, pass the exam to go to grade seven because they know after that grade six, there is not any school. So they wanted to stay at the grade seven, at the grade six for as they can, they build them intentionally. intentionally, and they have to, they have to. So, you know, losing the hope is normal at that situation. I'm saying that I am living far away from Taliban right now, but it's still because of the situation, because of what's going on on my family. Uh, you know, I, still I have many members of my family, especially girls in that country. I give up. So, but opportunity and at the difference of level supporting of uh, have family support helped me to continue. But I'm not satisfied with the, what I have now because, you know, now I, I, I somehow I think that I started from the scratch again. I lost my house. I lost my career in that country. I lost my readers. I lost, you know, my community. And even sometimes here, I not just give up for my, uh, you know, um, girls in Afghanistan. I give up for myself. So it, we cannot say that because they are weak, they are give up. The situation is really, really hard, and you will understand it better when you are a woman. And when you are a woman. The humiliation that came from that Taliban address is not easy. And unfortunately, I don't know what's going on after the Taliban always take the power. The family also change, you know, the dress, the appearance, their idea also is getting close to Taliban, the idea of Taliban, and it makes the situation really hard. And I know you have heard that. Um, we have a lot of self-humiliation right now again, at least in Herat and Badqis. That we are living the history. Thank you again. for your questions. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it is a sobering uh, situation you. right now. Thank we you appreciate so uh, you from your perspective, Homaira, being with us and Thank you so much. Uh, helping us understand it better so that we um, can be allies. Um, for those that continue to, so. to, to, to fight uh, for human rights in Afghanistan. Uh, if you have questions and you didn't have a chance to ask them, uh, feel free to come forward and uh, chat briefly with, uh, with Homaira. Uh, we sh sure appreciate you being here. Please join me in saying thank you. Thank you.
Um, but, you know, I, I, I wanted to say, please, I know after the Afghanistan collapse, many of our um, people came to United States, and between this, there are many young generation of girls and boys, I asked, asked you before. Please, if you see some application that the name of a girl or boys from Afghanistan, accept them in your university. Now they really need support. They don't have a home you know, in their country, and they should start it here. And they cannot do it without your support. Please help them as you can till they could find their way and till the Taliban again failed in Afghanistan. And at least we can return to our home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.